Okay, so thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Younes Lamzuri from University of Laven, who will speak to us about series of linear combinations of functions near the critical line. Please, Younes. Thank you, and um, I would like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me to speak today um, in Brazil, or, although remotely. Um, so I'll talk about a joint work with Yun Bukli on zeros of linear combinations of L functions near uh, the critical line. So first, let me start by um, defining okay, sorry, you know, uh, what an L function is roughly, and then we'll see later um, the um, correct assumptions that we're gonna use uh, for L functions in general. Uh, so, no. yeah, an L function is um, a Dirichlet series, which is absolutely convergent for real S greater than one and satisfies um, a few assumptions. So um, the first is an Euler product representation, um, which is, uh, as you can see, is different from uh, the server class definition. So we require the Euler product to be polynomial. Um, and the, the D here is called the degree of the L function. It measures the complexity. And, and um, we would like the L function to have an analytic a continuation to the complex plane as a monomorphic function and satisfies a functional equation that relates uh, the values at s with uh, the complex conjugate of the values at one minus s bar. So I will talk more, I will uh, give you exactly what we need here, what kind of functional equation we need later on. And then um, we, want the we want these coefficients here to, um, to, be, um, to behave nicely, in fact, to be bounded and this is what we call the Ramanujan hypothesis that all these coefficients are bounded by one. Um, so this hypothesis is known for certain L functions, but not for, for um, many others. And so later on, we will not request it. So we will use, we'll avoid it altogether. We'll use um, an average version, a weak average version, which is known, for example, for L functions attached to mass forms. So this is, um, these are L functions. So here are some examples for the non-experts. So um, L functions of degree one, these are the Riemann zeta function, as you all know, this is the um, series sum of one over n to the s, which has um, an order product over primes of degree one. And then you have the Dirichlet L functions, which are attached to uh, Dirichlet characters. So if you take a chi to be a Dirichlet character modulo q, the L function attached to chi is defined as the following um, series, so um, you have chi n over n to the s, because chi is completely multiplicative, you have an Euler product uh, of one minus chi p uh, over p to the s to the minus one. And again, you have um, an analytic continuation, um, and, uh, functional equation for both, and the coefficients here uh, uh, verify the Ramanujan hypothesis trivially. So these are L functions of degree one, um, for degree two, there are two kinds of L functions. There are um, what's called L functions attached to holomorphic cus forms. I will not dive in into the details here, but if you have a primitive holomorphic cus form of weight K and level N, you can write its Fourier coefficients as follows. When you normalize these coefficients by divide, dividing by this factor N to the K minus one over two. So you are left with these normalized Fourier coefficients lambda at N and you can put them in a Dirichlet series and then you have an L function. So the Dirichlet series is lambda Fn over n to the s, the sum. And in this case, you have an Euler product of degree two. So you have two factors here over alpha p and beta p and these are the roots of the equation x squared minus lambda Fp x plus epsilon p equals zero. Where epsilon p is one if p doesn't divide this level here and equals zero otherwise. So these are, um, L functions attached to holomorphic cut forms, GL2, and they satisfy, in this case, um, the Ramanujan um, hypothesis. This is due to the lean. And then there are uh, there is another type of L functions, which are more complicated, which I will not define. These are L functions attached to mass forms. Um, so they satisfy all properties except the Ramanujan hypothesis. And so if we'd like to um, use these L functions, for example, in our result, we would like to avoid the Ramanujan hypothesis. In uh, general, 
the Langlands program predicts that all L functions arise this way, meaning from some sort of cuspidal automorphic representation or of the group GLN. So the most important problem um, for L functions is of course the generalized Riemann hypothesis, the GRH, which predicts that if you have an L function, all complex um, number or complex um, zeros inside the critical, what's called the critical strip, the strip real row between zero and one, all lie on the, the critical line, the line of symmetry real S equals one half. And uh, of course, this is uh, far from being uh, proven, but an interesting uh, question here is to ask, well, do we actually need all the assumptions um, that we define the L functions by in order to at least uh, conjecturally um, uh, have the GRH, that, uh, that we, we can assure that to have the GRH conjecturally under um, these assumptions. So in particular, as we will see the motivation a little bit later on, can we get rid of assuming the earlier product representation? Can we just stick with meromorphic continuation and, and, and functional equation and the Ramanujan hypothesis or some very weak version of it, but without assuming an Euler product? And the answer to this um, question is no. So this was proved by Davenport and Heilbronn in 1936. And actually they investigated a special kind of some uh, sort of an interest in zeta function, which satisfy these two assumptions, but do not have an Euler product. And uh, it violates the Riemann hypothesis. So these are Epstein zeta function attached to positive definite quadratic forms of class number greater than or equal to two. So they proved that in this case, this Zeta functions satisfy these two assumptions. So it means that it has an analytic continuation to the complex plane and in functional equation satisfy the Ramanujan hypothesis. But not only it violates the Riemann hypothesis, it also has infinitely many zeros in the half plane of absolute convergence. So it has many zeros where it shouldn't, um, not only in the critical strip, but the half plane of absolute convergence. So, here are the, uh, here is the correct uh, precise definition of these Epstein and Zeta functions. So you have, you take a positive definite uh, binary quadratic form, QXY of negative discriminant. And then you take a Dirichlet series where you sum over all pairs of integers, not both zeros, uh, not both zero of one over QMN to the power S. So, and then you have um, you can analytically continue this theoretically series and you have a nice functional equation um, and um, the coefficients verify the Ramanujan hypothesis. And in fact, um, the way to prove this functional equation is by connecting these zeta functions to modular forms, right? in particular to Eisenstein series. So it's uh, these zeta functions are interesting from this point, uh, as, uh, uh, point of view. And they're also interesting because you can um, connect them to algebraic number theory. So in fact, they are connected to Didikane zeta function of imaginary quadratic fields. So in particular, if you write K to be the uh, imaginary quadratic field, uh, Q squared D and HD to be cl the class member of K, uh, recall that in the result of ha Davenport and Heilbronn, you need the class member to be greater than or equal to two for the Epstein zeta function to violate the Riemann hypothesis. And the reason here is that if the class number is one, actually the Epstein zeta function is more or less the Dedekind zeta function of the field up to a constant. A constant is the, um, the number of fruits of unity in this field. So you have a constant and you have the Dedekind zeta function because we believe that the Dedekind zeta function satisfies the GRH, and in this case, we believe that the Epstein zeta function also verified the GRH. However, uh, in the case where the class number is greater than or equal to two, we saw by Davenport and Heilbronn that it doesn't satisfy uh, GRH. It has in fact zeros even in the region of absolute convergence. And the reason 
comes from the fact that this, in fact, is a linear combination of Euler products. It's a linear combination of two or more L functions. In this case, Hecker L functions attached to the ideal class characters of the um, imaginary product P. So that's the reason why um, it violates the Riemann hypothesis because it's a linear combination. Sorry, so what do we know about? Can I ask a quick question? So, yes, of course. Um, in the HD equals one K, zeta KS, I guess, is LS times LS chi. Right. right. Um, so it's actually the product of two L functions, zeta yes. S and LS chi. And here you're saying if HD is greater than or equal to two, it's just a linear combination of L functions. I guess they're different types of L functions. Yes, um, they are different types, yes. Okay, so I mean, you're just thinking of something like zeta S LS chi as an L function in of itself. Yeah, so actually you can write the, the Dedekind zeta function, which is zeta S LS chi, um, as a linear combination of these Epstein zeta functions over all representatives of these, um, uh, of the binary quadratic forms in the equivalence classes of binary quadratic forms. Okay. So then you, you go the other way around and you can write each one as a linear co combination of Hecke L functions. So are these Hecker L functions that twists of zeta ks, I guess? Um, Maybe by the ideal class character. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you take the ideal class character and then you put the, um, uh, yeah, instead of one in the directly series, you, you put the ideal class character there. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so what do we know about the zeros of these Epstein zeta functions? So throughout the talk um, for complex valued function f of z, we shall denote by n of f sigma one sigma two t. Uh, this is going to be the number of zeros of f in the rectangle real s between sigma one and sigma two and height roughly up to t. So uh, for convenience, we take the height or the imaginary part to be between capital T to capital T where T is large. But you can do the same for imaginary between zero and capital T. Um, and then NF sigma T will be the number of zeros to the right of sigma. So um, if you, you wanna use this notation, then you, you, you change sigma T to infinity and then you have NF sigma T. So this is the number of zeros of F in the region real S greater than sigma and the imaginary S between capital T and two capital T. So what do we know about the zeros of these epstein zeta function inside the critical strip? Because this, this is the region where it's most interesting. So Voronin in 1976, so again, here we, we, we um, assume, well, I forgot to write this, but we assume that the class number is greater than or equal to two, otherwise it doesn't, uh, these results do not hold. So Voronin in 1976 proved that there are quite a lot of zeros. So there are at least a constant times T zeros in any strip uh, sigma one uh, less than, strictly less than sigma two and inside the critical, uh, the, to the right of the critical line. And then Yunbo Klee um, improved this to an asymptotic formula. So where you have this number of zeros is asymptotic. Uh, 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 excuse me, Yunis. Yes. For the result of the Ronin, you need T to be larger than something. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, okay. for, for T large. So all, all these results are for T large. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Of course. So, um, so Lee in 2014 proved that, um, so he proved this to an asymptotic formula where you have uh, uh, um, this number of zeros is asymptotic to some constant here that depends on E and sigma one, sigma two. So for simplicity, I, I didn't put the dependence on E. And then you can ask whether you can have um, uh, a quantitative asymptotic formula. So if you write epsilon sigma one sigma two t to be the difference between the number of zeros in the main term, then when, with Steve Gonick, um, uh, Gonick and Lee in 2017 uh, proved that the error term, uh, you can have a saving of um, uh, exponential of some constant uh, times square root log log t. So the error term is bounded by t times exponential minus a constant times square root log log t. And then um, I improved this uh, recently to a saving of power of log t. 
So here, the power depends of, on sigma one and the class number HD. In particular, it decreases with, with, uh, when the class number increases. And so all these results motivate the study of general linear combination of L functions, because these Epstein zeta functions are just um, uh, examples of linear combinations. So it might uh, may, it makes sense to investigate general linear combinations and see where are the zeros. And um, if there are violations in general um, of the, uh, the Riemann hypothesis, how, how many uh, can we quantify how many zeros are off the critical line? So we shall consider linear combinations of this form here, pj, lj, s, where um, the number, of course, of um, L functions involved is strictly greater than one. The bj's are any real numbers which are non-zero. And we normalize so that the sum of the bj square is one. So this just we normalize by, you can just take anything and normalize by the L2 norm. And here are the exact assumptions that we uh, would like the our L functions to satisfy. So as before, we would like an Euler product representation with uh, which is polynomial and have uh, some degree d. And here we would not require the, the Ramanujan hypothesis. We only need that these coefficients here are bounded by some p to the theta for theta less than one half. So in particular, this is verified for um, L functions attached to mass forms. Um, we would like that all the L functions involved satisfy the same functional equation. And the reason is that we would like this linear combination also to satisfy um, uh, a functional equation. Uh, so if you write lambda js to be the completed L function, uh, so you, you take the L function, you multiply by what's called the convector. Um, or the arithmetic conductor to the S and then product of gamma factors. So here we don't care about this. This is just some technical conditions. Then you have a functional equation relating the value of the completed function, uh, L function to the uh, complex conjugate at one minus S bar. And then you have some uh, number here with absolute value one, which is usually called the root number. So this is a, just a general form of uh, the functional equation. Uh, but the important thing that we want here is that all these L functions satisfy the same one, same functional equation. And then uh, we would like something that is much weaker than the Ramanujan hypothesis, what we call the weak Ramanujan hypothesis or Ramanujan hypothesis on average, uh, which tell us that these um, coefficients here, the coefficients that you saw in the Euler product, these guys here are a big O of x to the epsilon on average. So the sum over p up to x um, and the sum of these guys squared is big O x to the one plus epsilon. So these are standard assumptions. Now, in order to penetrate, so to study the joint distribution of these L functions, which will be a key component in counting the zeros, we would like an assumption on, um, so not GRH, but um, something that we can manage. So that put most of the zeros of these L functions, these individual L functions to the right of the critical line. Uh, so we would like a zero density estimate of this sort. Um, so note here that this is weaker than what Selberg proved, for example, for the Riemann zeta function, where he can replace log t, log t to the C1, C2 by log t, exactly. So we'd like some power saving uniformly for sigma greater than one half, but we can allow some large powers of log t. These will not affect the result because we will not be uh, super close to the one. And then because, uh, so because we are considering all these L functions together and we consider the linear combinations of these, we would like these L functions to satisfy a certain independence hypothesis that behave kind of independently. And this is encoded by what's called the Selberg orthonormality conjecture. So if you write the log of these L functions, remember this is an Euler product. So here I forgot to say for real S greater than one, um, you have log of the error product. So you have a sum over primes, in fact, sum over prime powers, some certain coefficients with P to the KS. What we would like is that if you take the coefficients of two um, different L functions, then there are constellations. 
a lot of cancellations. So if you have two different L functions that this term vanishes here and you have just big O of one roughly, but we, we would like something a little bit more precise than big O of one. We would like a constant uh, plus big O of one of log X. And then if you have the same L function, then you have this norm square here. And in this case, you have some constant CJ uh, log log X. So let me say a few words about these assumptions. So these assumptions are standard and are expected to hold for all L functions. Well, L functions arising from cuspid and automorphic representations on G and N. And in particular, uh, they are true, they hold for all L functions of degree one and degree two, which we saw before, and which are in the case of degree one, the Riemann zeta function and Dirichlet L functions. And in the case of degree two, L functions attached to holomorphic cusp form or mass cusp form. So even uh, uh, the, uh, the zero density, for example, is proved for all these, the weak Ramanujan, et cetera. And Selberg autonomous man. Um, in fact, for GL1 L functions, the Selberg autonomous is um, the is equivalent to the fact that the Dirichlet function is regular and non-zero at s equals one. Very well known fact. If chi is a non-principal character, while for GL2 the weak Ramanujan uh, hypothesis and the Selberg autonomous conjectures follow from uh, using the wrong thin uh, Selbeck convolution. So in all these cases, all these assumptions are proved. And so our result, the main result that I'm gonna state later on is gonna be true if you take a linear combination of any uh, of uh, L functions of GL1 or GL. Okay, so let's take um, L functions, J of them that satisfy our assumptions. If we write, um, each one of them as a Dirichlet series, which is absolutely convergent by the weak Roman hypothesis, then um, you have that the linear combination also has a Dirichlet series form, where the coefficients here, alpha fp uh, or, or alpha fn, are just the linear combination of the um, uh, Dirichlet coefficients of these Dirichlet series. And so since, um, so if you take the real S to be super large, uh, the first non-zero term will dominate the others. And so in particular, the supremum of the real part of the zeros is bounded. So you can write sigma F to be this supremum. So in particular, you have no zeros for sigma greater than sigma F. And you can use the functional equation. And this tells you that you will, you will not have zeros to the right, to the uh, left of one minus sigma f, except those one comings from the pole of the gamma functions in the completed L function. So you have a similar situation to, um, to L functions in this case. So you have trivial zeros to the left of some strip and inside the strip, meaning between uh, one minus sigma f and sigma f, you, you have only non-trivial, what we can call non-trivial zeros. And again, uh, using just some standard tools, uh, the uh, human principle, you can count how many non-trivial zeros here in this strip, which we can call also the critical strip for this linear combination. And by standard methods, the number of zeros is t log t, uh, constant, some subject to constant time t log t. And so we are interested to have some information on um, where are these zeros? And if there are violations of the Riemann hypothesis, can we quantify them? So let's start with um, zeros that are on the critical line. So that satisfy the Riemann hypothesis. So here, Montgomery um, conjectured that, in fact, almost all the non-trivial zeros of linear combinations. So here, of course, um, uh, of uh, linear combinations of L functions satisfying our assumptions same functional equation, et cetera, are on the critical one. So this is a conjecture of Montgomery. And it was proved in a seminal paper of Bombieri and Hedgehog in 95, uh, conditionally. So it was proved if you assume that all the individual L functions satisfy the GRH. And also um, a technical point in the proof, you need to assume a, a sort of a weak hypothesis on the spacing of the zeros of each individual L function. 
And in particular, this um, hypothesis follows from the pair correlation convention. So one way to see this result is that if you have GRH and pair correlation, then almost all uh, the zeros of um, any linear combination of n functions, which satisfy, of course, our assumptions, are on the critical line. In particular, the violation of the Riemann hypothesis are red. On the unconditional side, the only result we do have is due to Selberg, it's unpublished from 98, who proved that if you have uh, degree one n functions, if you have Dirichlet functions um, in your linear combinations, then a positive proportion of the non-trivial zeros are on the critical line. So now what about, so what's going to be interesting for us are the zeros of the critical line. So here uh, in the paper of Bombier and Hagehall, they conjecture that actually, uh, so they proved conditionally that uh, the number of zeros of the critical line is little o of t log t, but actually the little o is, actually, is in fact one over square root of log log t. So you have a saving of square root log log t over the total number of zeros. So this is what they conjectured. And um, motivated by this conjecture, H. Hall in 2000 studied many combinations of two n functions. In this case, you have, because of the normalization, remember you have uh, some coefficient b1 and b2 here, where you have b1 uh, square plus b2 square equals one. So in this case, you can write them as cos alpha and sine alpha for some real alpha. Um, he um, considered L functions satisfying all our assumptions, but also he requires the Ramanujan hypothesis um, and not a weak version of it. And then he has an almost all result for, so for almost all of these linear combinations. So when you, um, uh, you vary the alpha with respect to a certain measure, which I think is absolutely continuous with respect to, um, so absolutely continuous with the Lebesgue measure in any case. So for almost all of your linear combinations, you have that the number, we call this is the number of zeros of your linear combination or of F, uh, where the real part is to the right of one, plus, uh, one half plus one over GT. And the imaginary part is uh, between capital T and two capital T. And so he proved that the order of magnitude of this is T GT divided by square root log of T, which if you take GT to be log, uh, log T, so, um, uh, so distance one over log t from the critical line, which is more or less um, of the critical line, uh, then you, you have this conjecture of the in the job. So here the distance he could take, he couldn't get as close as log t, uh, so he could get as close as log t divided by log log t to the one plus epsilon. And gt is bigger than log t to, to the epsilon. And then he has a, a precise conjecture um, for what this number should be. It's a constant here. Um, so the C1 and C2 are coming from the selberg romanti conjecture. Um, so uh, that you have here. So if you have the same L function, then you have the, the norm square of beta LGP, the coefficient of the log um, gives you Cj uh, log log x. If you take C1 for L1 and C2 for L2. So you have the cons uh, a constant which is square root C1 plus C2 divided by A pi to three halves. And then you have TGT divided by square root log GT. So this is H halves conjecture for uh, linear combinations of two L functions. So now I can state the main results. And the main result is a proof of this conjecture, but in a restricted range of GT. And not only that, but we can also prove it for any uh, number. Uh, so a linear combination of any number of L functions. So here is our main result. And also we, uh, we have just the weak Ramanujan instead of the Ramanujan hypothesis. So you have, um, so we take a linear combination as before of L functions satisfying our assumptions. Um, we let C to be the maximum of the CJs in the Selberg Autoromantic conjecture. So C depends uh, on the L functions. And mu um, is a number which can go up to, 
roughly constant divided by j. j is the number of L functions in your linear combination. And it depends also on the C here, but the C, uh, if you take L functions which are fixed and you, you make this grow, then roughly you can see nu as being of uh, the size one over j. Then in the range gt between log log t and log t to this power nu, we have an exact asymptotic formula for the number of zeros of the linear combination uh, to the right of one half plus one over gt. So you get exactly um, the main term of H Hans conjecture, tgt divided by square root log gt. You have a saving, uh, a logarithmic saving of gt in the, the error term. And what is this constant? Well, this constant is given by the following uh, formula. So what you should get here from this, and I will talk a little bit about it later, is that the function that you see here, the, um, the, the, let's say uh, the, the, the weight that you see here against which you have this integral here is in fact that of a Gaussian. So the Gaussian will play an important role here in, um, in our result, and you will see in a minute why. In a minute why. Um, and in particular, an easy calculation uh, when the case where you have two gives you a uh, h hans conjecture that the exact constant is square root c1 plus c2 divided by a pi to the three halves. So, um, so this is a major improvement of h hans theorem uh, where you have two linear combination, uh, linear combination of two L functions, but on almost all result not of, for a singular one. Uh, the drawback here is that we couldn't get with current method up to uh, log t or log t to the one minus epsilon. We had just a small power of log t. And you will see why um, uh, from, uh, from the meter. Okay, so um, in the remaining part of the talk, I would like to uh, discuss the main ideas of the proof. So the starting point is Littlewood's lemma, which is a standard lemma for counting zeros which tells you that the um, integral of nf u t, so the number of zeros to the right of u, and up to high t from sigma one to sigma two, um, is up to an error term equals um, uh, this moment here, the difference of these two moments. So log of the norm of f sigma one plus i t and the same at sigma two. And you have some error term, which is the distance between sigma two and sigma one times t. So this is the starting point. And of course, if you want to have information on the left-hand side, then you need to have an asymptotic formula for this moment here, the log of the norm of the linear combination, the difference of these two logs. So what we are gonna do is as follows. So first, we're gonna construct a probabilistic random model, which we will call F sigma S, uh, F sigma X, sorry, for this linear combination, F sigma plus IT. Then we will prove that the moments that we have here um, are close to those of the corresponding probabilistic random model. Uh, sorry here, I think there is a mistake. It should be, shouldn't be one over two pi. Uh, it should be one over t here instead of two pi. And then the last step will be to estimate the difference of, of these moments. So the, to estimate the probabilistic side. So, uh, we construct probabilistic random model, we go from these moments to the moments of the probabilistic random model, and then we estimate them when sigma is close to one half. And we need to estimate when h here, so the distance we need the, in order to have information on f u t, we need sigma one and sigma two to be very close. And so we need a sigma plus h uh, uh, as sigma, to replace sigma one and sigma two. So here is how we construct the random model. So Recall that your linear combination here um, is in fact for sigma greater than one, a linear combination of Euler products. And so I wrote this Euler product instead of sigma plus it here, I moved to the p to the it on top. And so we have this p to the minus it. And as you all know, um, as t goes to infinity, we expect these p to minus it's to behave like independent identically distributed run variables distributed on the unit circle. So we can uh, um, change P to my, minus IT with these run variables and then this give us, this will give us the random model. 
So uh, more precisely, we let xp to be a sequence of iid random variables uniformly distributed on the unit circle, and we form the random order product. So each corresponding to an L function, Lj sigma x will be the product. Um, and here, it will be the same product here, except that you change p to minus it to xp. And because if you take the log and you compute the variance, you'll have the sum of this guy square divided by p to the two sigma, then uh, you can see that these products converge almost surely uh, for sigma greater than one half. This follows from Kolmogorov's three series uh, theorem. And so you can define now um, the um, probabilistic random model, which will um, modelize the linear combination. So this will be the linear combination of this random order product. So, and we will define, we will uh, write it as F sigma X. And here the key result is that, so again, I remind you of the definition. So F sigma plus IT is the linear combination of these L functions. F sigma X is the linear combination of the front order product. Which, uh, which are um, valid for sigma strictly greater than one half. And, and so under the assumptions um, of the main ther uh, theorem, we have, so here I correct uh, my mistake. It's, it's one over t, not one over two pi. The moments here on uh, the L function side is equal to the moments on the probabilistic um, random uh, model side. And you have a saving or a logarithmic saving, which is more than enough for our purposes. So this is the key result. And I will discuss the main ideas in the proof of this result. And then the last part will be um, investigating this part here. So uh, the uh, probabilistic random model part. So to investigate this moment here, we will in fact um, investigate the joint distribution of these L functions. So that's, this is the first, or uh, let's say the main idea in the proof. So we will investigate the joint distribution of these L functions. So we let uh, capital L sigma plus IT denote uh, this uh, random vector, log norm L1 sigma plus IT up to log norm LJ sigma plus IT. So this, these are the real parts of the logs. And you have the arguments, which are the imaginary parts. And we would like to investigate um, how these are um, distributed in particular with uh, relation to the random model. So we change this, everything um, from uh, P to the IT to these XPs. And then we end up with real parts of the logs and the imaginary parts of the logs of the random order products. And we call this uh, capital L Sigma X. And to measure how close are the distributions, we are going to investigate or to bound uh, the following quantity, which we call the discrepancy of the measures. So what, is, so what is this? So it's the supremum over all boxes. Uh, so P here stands for a box, a rectangular box in the space R2Js with sides parallel to the coordinate axis and which can be unbounded. So supremum of all these boxes of the normalized Lebesgue measure. So mesh is the me Lebesgue measure of points T in, um, in some uh, diadic interval, capital T to capital T, for which your, run, uh, your vector of L values here lies in your box. And then you subtract the corresponding probability that the random uh, vector lies in this box. And you want to have a bound on this difference, but uniformly over all boxes. That's what we call the discrepancy. And so what we prove here is that um, in this range, and you can see already that we are away from uh, log T here, um, we have a bound on this discrepancy, which is square root of the distance uh, of one over the distance from sigma to one half. So square root of GT log log T divided by square root log T. So this puts, um, already um, a restriction on GT. GT has to be less than square root log T divided by log log T. So the proof is a generalization uh, of 
a result of mine um, with uh, Steve Lesser and Maxime Rodrigo from 2019 that we put the Riemann zeta function. And basically it goes as follows. So here are some ideas quickly. So we use uh, recall this assumption A4. This is the zero density SMH, which puts uh, most of the zeros to the right of uh, one half. So we use this SMA to approximate log of the L functions, but by short Dirichlet polynomials. So here, the Dirichlet polynomials are going to be over powers of primes, of prime powers, where y here is much is, uh, is much smaller than t. So uh, there is a, a technical. Um, uh, so here, this this is a technical parameter. So I won't uh, give you the choice, but some y which is much smaller than t, and you can do this um, with the zero density estimate for almost all t's. So for t for all t's except for a set of very small measures. And we can allow ourselves this because all our results are probabilistic. We are just interested about the distribution. So we can throw these exceptional sets um, in the air term. Then once we do this, we can do the same for the Euler, uh, for the probabilistic random model here by easier methods. These are just chip shifts in quality bound in the second moment um, of the tail. And you can show that log of Lj sigma x is approximated by um, the um, sh a short degree polynomial, except for an event with a small probability. Now what we will do is that we compare these um, Dirichlet polynomials, the the, um, the one the the ones over sigma plus it and the random ones, and we do this just by the method of mode. So we uh, compute the joint moments. And because the, this parameter here, y is small, it allows us to, um, so in particular, smaller than t to the epsilon, let's say for any epsilon, it allows us to compute all moments, all joint moments here, because the length is going to be uh, less than t. And we, we can show that only the diagonal terms here survive, and the diagonal terms correspond exactly to the moments of the probabilistic random model. And then once we do this, then we can go to the Fourier transform or the characteristic function. And then we can prove that the characteristic function of the random uh, of the vector of L values is very close to that of the random ve vector. And finally, we use Berlin Selvig polynomial to do some Fourier inversion to, to go from the characteristic function to the uh, probability distribution function, and hence uh, to bound the discrepancy of the distribution. So this is the ideas of the proof of uh, the discrepancy result. Okay, so now using this, let me discuss what we need to do now to in order to prove the key result. Um, so recall that, um, so we would like to, to, um, to have an asymptotic for this moment. We can do this if we can understand the distribution of log of f sigma plus it, uh, we can call this distribution function du. And um, we can write this as, in fact, the measure of points t where the random vector lies in some region of uh, this Euclidean space R2j. So the region is that uh, these guys here, because you have log of uh, the linear combination, so you can uh, change the log to um, an exponential, you have the norm is bounded by e to the u, and uh, the norm is uh, correspond to this uh, region for these coordinates. So you would like to, we would like to understand this weird region of the Euclidean space. Once we do this, um, and we would like to understand this for parameters u, which are not too large. We would like to cut here, um, so for you not to go into minus infinity or plus infinity, to have some control. And so um, we would like, in fact. Uh, to use the discrepancy result and to cover um, this region of the space by boxes, by rectangular boxes. And so we use a delicate geometric argument to do this, but in fact, we can encounter some technical problems. And, uh, and these arise exactly from, from this here, from this integral. We would like to cut this integral. So we'd like you to not be going to minus infinity or plus infinity. So, to, for you not to go to plus infinity, we would like to control large values of this. So we would like to control the large values. 
of the um, linear combination, which is equivalent to controlling log values of the L functions themselves. And this is achieved by bounding the large deviations of log of the LJs, which uh, we are in fact roughly Gaussian. Um, also, we would like to control uh, the values where u can go to minus infinity. So u goes to minus infinity is the same as f vanishes, um, which is similar to controlling the logarithmic singularities of this log of the linear combination. This is in fact the main technical part that um, uh, makes this exponent in uh, new in the main result very small. So this is in fact achieved by bounding um, the two kth moment of log of the norm of f sigma plus i t. And finally, we would like to, uh, so because this covering here, we lose something when we cover by boxes, we would like to not lose a lot when we pass to the random variable. So we'd like to um, control the concentration of the random variable, that the random variable is not um, a lot concentrated on some thin uh, slices, let's say, where we lose um, the covering by boxes here. So these are the main ideas that allow us to approve the pure result too. So in the last few minutes, I would like to talk about the probabilistic part now. Um, what are the main ideas that allow us to um, prove not, all, uh, not just an assumptive formula for this moment, but in fact, an assumptive formula for the difference of these two moments, because this is exactly what we need for our result if you remember for little lemma. And what we prove in this case is that if you take H to be slightly smaller than one over GT, then we have this asymptotic formula for M sigma minus M sigma plus or minus H. M sigma will be our moment for log of the norm of the uh, probabilistic random model. So we have a constant um, two pi K zero. K zero is the same as the constant of the main theorem divided by log GT to the three halves plus some error term. And the idea here is that in fact, the log of the LJs, remember here, um, this is the expectation of log of norm linear combination of the LJs. So we can understand this if we understand the joint distribution of log of the LJ sigma X. And uh, if we write this as YJ, this is approximated by, so if we threw the sum over prime powers, this is approximated by the sum over primes where you have independent IID random variables uniformly distributed on the unit circle. And so you expect this to be Gaussian. And in fact, if you um, compute the correlations of these random variables by a Selberg automatic conjecture, these correlations should be uh, close to the correlations of these sums, which are exactly this. Sorry, the, this should be K here instead of J. And uh, we know that by celebrity autonomity that you, you, you have a lot of consolation. So in fact, if J equals K, you have a big term here, and otherwise it's uh, bounded, we go off one. And so it makes sense that the joint distribution now of this random vector can be approximated by that of um, a random vector of Gaussians. So, a real part here, and so you have a real part Z1, real part Zj, and the metric parts. But the Zjs are not correlated because once you uh, divide by this factor, you have very small correlations here, little o1. So, and are correlated, and then it's independent, because for Gaussian, that's the interesting fact. If you have uncorrelated Gaussian, then they are independent. And they have variances which are minus what you, you get here exactly, minus Cj log sigma minus one half. So the key idea is to approximate, in fact, the joint distribution here by Gaussians, by independent Gaussians with different variances. And in fact, this is in the spirit of Selberg's central uh, limit theorem. Um, except that here we have a precise estimate coming from a probabilistic random model. So if you take sigma to be one half plus one over GT, the variance becomes CJ log GT. And so we can uh, prove an asymptotic formula for the density function of the random vector by comparing to the Gaussian. That's what we do. Uh, we establish an asymptotic formula, in fact, of the, for the characteristic function, the Fourier transform of the random vector 
um, by comparing it exactly to the Gaussian, that's what you saw in the main theorem, the weights. And then you, we use Fourier inversion. And then we, uh, we compare this moment that we want to the moments of Gaussians. Exactly, we change this log of the LJs, which are in the exponential here, to these uh, random variables ZJs, which are Gaussian independent and have these variances here. And then we change the variances a little bit and we would like to understand this difference and uh, it turns out to be um, um, a delicate, a technical problem, but not uh, very difficult. So we change ZJs and ZJs tilde because we would like um, the variance now, we would like uh, uh, information on M sigma and M sigma plus H or minus H. So we'd like to change, to tweak a little bit these variances. So maybe if I have one or two minutes, I can quickly prove the main theorem uh, using all these results, depending on the organizers what they think. Of course, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, so again, this is the constant that you see here. And as you saw, you have the Gaussians here. This is the Gaussians in, and you can see this um, variance, the, the, the CJs coming in and the variance is here. In fact, you have a CJs uh, 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 log GT, and that's why, in fact, we divide by square root log GT. It's coming from, from the Gaussian. So here's the proof. So H is one over GT log GT. Now we have all the ingredients. Um, since NF WT is um, non-decreasing, then you can bound NF sigma T between uh, two integrals, one from sigma minus H to sigma, and the other one from sigma to sigma plus H. And here, this is just H here. And then uh, let's study these two integrals. So now little lemma tells you that you can go from these integrals to the moments of log of f, the difference of these two moments. The key result theorem two gives, tells you that you can go from f sigma plus it to the random model. And so you get from this side to the probabilistic side. And then the last uh, result, which is theorem four, the investigation of the random model by comparing the random model to the Gaussian allows you to, in, uh, to prove an assumption to form of this, where you have a leading term coming from the Gaussian, and then you have t divided by log gt to the three halves. And you have the same asymptotic in both sides, and so you have the, an asymptotic for this. So you just give, multiply by gt divided by, um, uh, multiply by gt, sorry, log gt. That's why you have k0 t gt divided by square root log gt uh, in the main result. So that's all I would like to uh, say. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eunice. Very nice talk. Thanks. If uh, anybody wants to ask questions, feel free. I just open your mic. Well, Marco here, I just want to make a comment. I'm very impressed that uh, that uh, substitute for a random model here would bring something, some information. Very nice. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the reason is that we are a little bit away from the critical line. That's the main, I mean, the main issue, it gets harder and harder um, to get close to the critical line. Once you are a little bit off, then, then the random model, um, coming from the random model product with over primes works very well. I have a question related to the first part of the talk. Okay. Um, when you had the, when you had you booked, you booked these results, uh, you had the constant C of sigma one, sigma two. Yes, yeah. For, when you change the class number or when you change D, um, can someone um, you know, investigate how that depends on the class number or how it changes with the class number? And for the constant? Um, yeah. Well, actually, I mean, uh, the constant here um, depends also on the random model. So it's, uh, I, I cheated a little bit here. But actually, you can get it from um, a corresponding random model to, this, to the Epstein zeta function. So what happened is that um, um, the epsilon zeta function is a linear combination of Hecke L functions. 
And so you can, um, again, you change, you, you write these HEC L functions, which are gonna be degree two L functions. So you write them as a, an Euler product. You change P to the IT to P to XP. You have a random model. And then um, this constant uh, depends on the moment of the random model. But, uh, but this is a good question. I don't know if anybody has investigated like how does this depend on uh, like the number of um, like uh, on J, uh, the number of linear combinations um, that you have here. I, I don't have any idea, but we can write it explicitly. We know exactly what it is. It's some integral, some uh, expectation, but, but uh, the advantage is that once we, so of our result is that once we go close to the half line, the probabilistic random model becomes close to the Gaussian and then we can, we can compute things. But once we are away, uh, like by, uh, if, if we have like, we can prove the similar results for, uh, not exactly, but, uh, but the method is robust to prove similar results if you have um, sigma one, if you, uh, if you are to the right of sigma one where sigma one uh, is strictly greater than one half. Uh, but then again, uh, you will, uh, so results like this here where you have um, the main term and then you have T divided by log T to the alpha. But then uh, we can write exactly what is this, but I don't know how to compute it or how to show any dependence um, on the class members. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question if I may ask. In fact, uh, two questions. So first one is um, the discrepancy result, um, the proof how much it depends on the Euler product I mean, how strongly you are using uh, the, the assumption. So, sorry, what, what do you mean? I mean, I don't understand the question. So the discrepancy, I mean, the way it's constructed you you need the um, the order product because this is how you construct uh, this is how you construct the random variable so mm -hmm. um, you have you you need the independence over primes so if you have just the Dirichlet uh, series then you don't have independence um, so because you have a, an, a product over primes um, um, these you have like separate blocks of primes and we we expect primes to be independent and that's how we um, we can work with a nice uh, probabilistic random model. But in general, if we have just a Dirichlet series, um, then there is, uh, I mean, you, can, you can't, uh, you, you, can, you can make it into a, a random model by changing N to the IT uh, by um, uh, a random multiplicative function. Yes, that's you can do. So a, uh, instead of, uh, so, so you if you have, for example, uh, a series here. Yeah, in particular. Gonna what, be yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. So, in particular, what I had in my mind is uh, the Dirichlet series correspond to half integral with modular form, for example. Mm -hmm. So it uh, does not have Euler product. So yes, yes. Curious that uh, is it possible to prove a similar result? But this I don't know. I mean, the way you you, sh you could proceed is by changing. So here you have n to the s. So you can write it as n to the sigma times n to the it, mm -hmm. and then you can change n to the it uh, to um, xn, where xn is random uh, multiplicative function. I think Marco has a result, some something similar um, with uh, collaborators, um, where they um, study a model for the Riemann zeta function where you change uh, the partial sum, the sum n to the s up to t for, uh, for n up to capital T by xn divided by, um, uh, so here's, uh, so in the result, uh, it's on the half line. So instead of one over n to the half plus it, you change it by um, xn divided by square root n, where xn is uh, a random multiplicative function. So perhaps you can do the same here, uh, except that it's going to be more difficult to study this um, this uh, random model, yeah, for sure. Yes. 
Yeah, so I have a second question if I may ask. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, have you thought of uh, for the smaller interval also? And uh, I mean, let's T to 2T, can you take like T to T plus H and how small H we can take? By yeah, using... It might be possible. Um, uh, however, I think H cannot be that small. Uh, I might be mistaken, but maybe the best you can do is some as uh, logarithmic saving. So maybe t divided by log t to some power. But you can, uh, for sure you can, uh, the method is not strong enough to go to t to the beta, for example, with beta is strictly smaller than one. Maybe you can get some power saving, yeah. Maybe t divided by log t to, to something might work. Like t to the power three by five or something? Yeah. H is t divided by log t to, to some power to c or c mm -hmm. small might work. Yeah, definitely t divided by log log t should work. Yeah, but perhaps you can you, you can go to a power of t, uh, a power of log t. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks a lot. Nice talk. Thank you. So I'm, uh, I'm a bit curious about how, because I mean, if you take, so you're looking at uh, combinations of, of uh, L functions and you say, what, what's the minimal uh, condition that you need for it to have infinitely many primes? Because I mean, if you take only one, then it, and this won't. Uh, infinitely so many zeros or? Um, yeah, if you many zeros, yes. So any, any combination of at least two L functions we already have, uh, if you need many zeros? Well, uh, I mean, my question is if there is some um, linear combination, linear relation between the BJs that will. Uh... Ah. Well, I mean, the BJs can be arbitrary. That's the thing. There is no nothing about them. You can have linear relations between the BJs. The, the main uh, thing is that you need. The, um, that the LJs are linearly independent. Um, yeah. so, so you need that, yeah. If you have a linear combination of the LJs, it cannot be zero. Okay. So you need some sort of, so you cannot, for example, take L1 and minus L1. That's it's gonna be cheating, right? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, L1 yeah. plus minus L1 is gonna be zero all the time. So, but, but, but if you take L1 and L2, yeah. Yeah. Okay, my question is to understand what, what's the constant, what the constant is in terms of- oh, The of constants the are arbitrary. So it's yeah, just... you take any BJs you want, just non-zero, mm -hmm. because of course, if they are zero, then it reduces the number and that's mm -hmm. it. And real ones, yeah. I mean, okay. you can cheat and take complex ones, but then it makes the argument a little bit difficult because you, you need to make, um, mm. I mean, you, you can take the complex, the, um, the argument and put it inside the functional equation if you want inside the root number. But mm -hmm. you take yeah, you take any coefficients you want, and the same result works. And the idea here is that in fact, because these L functions are independent, uh, what happened is that basically what happened is that one of them dominates the other, and this is the main idea mm -hmm. in Bombier and Hirschhardt's proof here. Okay. So once you take linear combination. Um, so here's, where is the point? Yeah, something like this. Then you can show that um, uh, most often what will happen is that on long segments, one of them will be the dominant, mm -hmm. dominates the others. And so it's this one that creates um, the zeros, more or less. Mm -hmm. That's on, 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 uh, on the half line, but of the half line, it's, it's a bit different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, so maybe a less uh, interesting question. So um, these uh, assumptions, A1, A2, A3 tilde, and A4 and A5, are they satisfied by any, um, so it's a, is, is the Rankine-Selberg for GLN 
uh, enough information? Do you can you, can you apply this for GL3? That's my question. Yeah, for GL3, it's not known. For example, um, zero what density is, is not known for GL3. Ah, okay, zero density. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, zero density is not zero known. density enters where? It's which which A? Um, A4. So A4. so zero density is known if you are close to the one line. This is um, Michel and Kowalski for GLA. If you are, if you have some results close to the one line, and you need just to push the zeros, most of them a little bit to the left of one line, this is fine. But okay. but have something uniform up to the half line, with a power saving, and uh, then this is only known for GL two. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, weak Ramanujan is known for by Rinkin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. I yeah, weak Ramanujan is fine. So A1, A2, A tilde, three, and probably A5 should be fine. That's Selberg okay. normality. You need some automorphy though, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But for GL3 is fine. Uh, but A4 is the one that's, yeah, zero density is the one that. I see. And I, all of these methods that show non-trivial zeros, they show non-trivial zeros close to the half line. Yes, exactly. Because we want to understand the zeros close to the half line. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as you said, if you want zeros like in the region of absolute convergence, then it should be true probably for all um, linear combinations of L functions in GLN. Probably. No, no, no. No, but I, but I mean, in. Uh, but can, can, can you show, can you show for these alpha? Okay, so you showed that to the zones that they have many non-trivial zeros, but you showed that they are close to the half line. Can you also show that, there are, for example, many non-trivial zeros close to the three quarters line? Can you also show that? Yes, yes, of course, yeah. I, I thought you had some condition about uh, sigma being close to one half plus one over GT. No, no, no. So you can, I mean, the, the result is robust enough. So instead, of, so this is the main result. If I change um, half plus one over GT by some sigma, let's say mm -hmm. three quarters here, then you will have a uh, constant times T in this case. So there is no GT, no square root, just like the ones of the Epstein zeta function. Yeah, but the method works, you're right. It's just we okay. we were more interested about counting zeros near to the half line. So All right, because the hardest. But you'll have a constant, but the difficulty in this case is to show that the constant is positive. That's the thing. So the method gives you the, the constant. The constant is some sort of uh, moments of the corresponding random model. But but to prove that it's this moment is positive is a, is not easy. Okay. In fact, so here is a, a, a funny fact. So you have this result, so for, for F sine zeta function. Um, so this result of Lee, or for example, Gonick Lee or myself, where we have this asymptotic formula for this, we cannot prove that this guy is positive. In fact, the, uh, the proof that this is positive follows from Voronin's result, that it's, uh, and Voronin's result doesn't have anything to do with these methods, it's just, a, a consequence of his universality theorem mm -hmm. for joint Heke uh, L functions. So you have Heke L functions, they are universal. It means that you can approximate the shifts by, uh, you can approximate, sorry, any analytic functions by shifts of these mm -hmm. um, in some uh, circle, um, uh, in some disk inside the critical strip. And then it gives you that this is at least T. And, and this implicitly showed that this constant is positive, but we, we cannot, I mean, I don't know how to prove, just by giving you the constant, show this, this is a mm -hmm. moment of some random model, uh, prove to me that this is positive. Uh, uh, me personally, I don't know how to do this. Okay. Good. That was very nice. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know. Any still question? Uh, I have a question. Okay, so for the key point uh, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, in, uh, that uh, error term is one over log t to the power beta. So I want to know whether this beta, the constant, can depend on this bj and the, uh, or kcj and so on. 
or it's some absolute yes 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 no 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 it's not absolute it depends on on yeah yeah of course uh, so oh yeah 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 it's it's a very small constant so okay so maybe, maybe I, I think the previous page by the way yeah this beta yes yeah 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 it depends on j and it depends uh, on the key G, G, okay it depends on page thank you but it's very, very small. We don't care a lot. So it comes from this geometric uh, covering argument it's, um, where we have um, this proof here. So we have, uh, we would like to understand this and the discrepancy tell us how to do this for boxes, but we would like to understand this for this weave region. And once we do this geometric argument, then we lose a lot. So uh, the discrepancy tell us that you can save um, uh, square root gt divided by square root log t, but then this uh, geometric argument um, allows us to save just a little bit. And this is where the condition, um, one of the uh, cases where the condition here comes from is because we want, we would, yeah, of the new comes from, we would like this beta to be positive. So it's, this is uh, the optimization problem tell us that if you have, you want beta to be positive, then you want new to be less than this. Okay, so so this is uh, uh, op optimal uh, uh, to make beta uh, to be positive. positive. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yes, from the meeting. Well, uh, I remember now there is some a problem that I started to work some years ago. Just think mm -hmm. a little bit and, and then uh, have no ideas was about zeros of random Dirichlet series of independent summons. Do you think that uh, uh, with the techniques you developed here, we can say something about this problem? I frankly, I don't really know. Um, I think that's more general than what we do here because you have random Dirichlet series, right? So you don't have um, you have you don't have this nice structure of having an or a product, so you don't have the sum of independent. Um, but it, indeed, it's a very interesting problem. So in this case, you have you have um, uh, okay. So the summons oh okay, but you have the summons that are independent. Um, yes, uh, I proved it, uh, a result which says. Mm -hmm. I studied only the real zeros and the real zeros, they okay. accumulate in the, near the, the half line. Ah, but okay. I want to know the complex zeros, what happened with them? Because there is a result which says that uh, a, any Dirichlet series has no zeros up to a certain point to the right. To, to the right. Yes. So I was thinking if you can say something, what, what's the first time when, when it starts to have zeros? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, in fact, this question for epstein zeta function was studied by Bombieri and Muller uh, in a paper. So they have um, just, I think it was Q square root minus five, the epstein zeta function uh, there. And they would like to know where is the supremum of the, the root part of the zeros. And they have some numerics. It's interesting. but. But for general, um, or for your question, I don't really know. If, um, but that's interesting. I, I would think about it. I would find something that I can email you. Okay, thank you. All right. I think uh, it's okay to wrap it up right now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you a lot, students. Thanks again. Thank you, Ramon. And thank you, all the organizers. And I hope everybody is going to be well. <laughs>